Good day, dear great surgeon. Today we are gonna talk about a very important, crucial topic, which is trauma and ER. It's not important only for your MRCS exam, but in your real life, as a doctor or physician, you will be faced with many aspects from this chapter, and you will have to be updated with the most common and recent ATLS and PLS protocols. We will talk about them in our voice shots, so be ready and prepare your favorite drink and let's have a journey through the trauma and ER. Let's go for it. You have to suspect an enterocutaneous fistula if there is excessive drainage and bubbles. Bus may confuse the surgeons, leading them to make a diagnosis of wound infection. If there is any uncertainty, methylene blue can be given and track the fistula. If missing blue is found in the drain, this confirms the presence of the fistula. Of course, you know that fistula is a connection between two epithelial surfaces. It's like a tube connecting surface with another, unlike the sinus, which is a tube connecting two in the space. Of course, the fistula may be enterocutaneous or enteroenteric or enterocolic or enterovasical or enterovaginal according to what surface it connected to. It may connect a column to column, so it's colocolic, enterocolic, uh, if it's uh, connecting the small intestine, enterovaginal, if uh, connecting uh, to the vagina, enterovasical is uh, connecting to the bladder, enterocutaneous if it's connecting to the skin, okay? When a perianal fistula occur secondary to Crohn's disease, the best management often to drain acute sepsis and maintain the drainage through just the uh, use of cetone wire, use cetone uh, wire, while the medical management is implemented. So give medical and cetone wire. This is the perianal Crohn's fistula. Why we don't use suction drain intraabdominal? Because the suction drain intraabdominal may be blocked by the peritoneum, and if there is a bleeder, it may increase the bleeder. So we have to put on the tube drain on a bag, which will drain by capillarity. As we have talked before, you can remove silk from your dictionary, except for MRCS, uh, they use it for drain support. They use the silk sutures for drain support, because it can be knotted easily and reliably and fast. Uh, some may use it uh, for... Uh, Skin closure in the dirty space like uh, the palm of uh, the sole of the foot. I don't prefer it in practice, but they may accept it in MRCS. Try to use polyproline because it's monofilamentous, unlike the silk which is polyfilamentous. And this uh, polyfilamentous will increase the incidence of bacterial infection. Remember that the mayo repair in hernia doesn't involve implantation of prosthetic mesh. Take care. So the usage of antibiotic prophylaxis is not advised. Okay, again, the major repair in hernia doesn't involve prosthetic mesh. So antibiotic is not advised because we only take prophylactic antibiotic in some circumstances. One of them, when you are using a prosthetic. In major repair, you are not using a prosthetic mesh. Did you know that in laparoscopy we use carbon dioxide gas for pneumoproteinium and the insufflation of uh, the intraproteinial cavity? Why carbon dioxide? Why carbon dioxide is the agent of choice in laparoscopy? Because it's rapidly reabsorbed and doesn't support combustion and cheap, available, abundant. It's rapidly cleared from the lung and so has no effect on the pH. The most common cause for bile leak after laparoscopic cholecystectomy is dislodged clip from the cystic duct. It may be tempting to try the plan to manage this surgically. The anatomy is often unfavorable surgically, and the duct will be very difficult to be identified. So an ERCP will be the mode of choice to manage this case after bile leak and has the advantage of demonstrating the cause of the leak and allow the placement of the stent. This will usually allow the resolution of most leak without the need for surgery. Scalp wounds are very vascular. 
because the scalp vascularity is highly. So adrenaline is much added to lignocaine to give it durability and for hemostasis. ERCB endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. ERCB is a procedure used to investigate the abnormality of the pile duct and pancreatic duct and the ample of water by the endoscope. The endoscope is inserted through the mouth and enters the duodenum through uh, the ampulla of water to enter the pancreatic duct and the uh, biliary tree. It has many uses, especially if uh, obstructed uh, bile duct or even a bile leak. So you have to understand what we are talking about when we are saying ERCP. It's an endoscope, not a major procedure uh, intra-abdominal. It's a simple procedure. Take care that ERCB itself may cause pancreatitis. Yes, very common uh, complication after ERCB is pancreatitis because the ERCB endoscopy uh, is going through the ampulla of water which is passing in front of the pancreatic duct. You know that the pancreatic and the compound duct are joining together to form the ample of water in the second part of the duodenum. During ERCB, we often use a monopolar diacermic device in a cutting mode. Okay, the monopolar diacermic is required during ERCB. In carcinoid tumor, we use octoretid. The somatostatin inhibits the release of number of gut hormone. The octoretid is synthetic alternative to somatostatin and thus the most appropriate therapeutic agent in carcinoid syndrome. Of course, you know that the carcinoid syndrome is a carcinoid tumor which is secreted serotonin. It originates from the neuroendocrine cell, Abbott cell, in the intestine, the midgast uh, distal ileum, uh, especially the appendix, very famous for uh, carcinoid uh, syndrome. It can occur in the rectum and the bronchi either, but very famous for the appendix. Uh, hormonal symptoms mainly occur when the disease is spread outside the bowel. So the carcinoid syndrome, hormonal symptoms, when it is spread outside the bowel. The clinical features are the onset is insidious over many years, flushing of the face, palpitation, and pulmonary valve stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation causing dyspnea, asthma, and severe diarrhea. It will be secretory resistant uh, despite fasting. Of course, the investigation for carcinoid syndrome is 5 HIA, 5 HIAA in 24-hour urine collection, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, and CT scan, and blood testing for chromography A. The treatment will be octoretid and surgical removal. The carcinoid tumor is a very major example for why we have to do histopathology after the section of anything in our body. That's why a surgeon more likely to histopathology for each appendix. Appendix, I, I know if you are general surgeon, you will be doing appendectomies like forever without even histopathology, but it's for medical legality and maybe a carcinoid tumor will be existing. Is it right for the patient and for the safety at all? In the face, you care for the cosmesis and the beauty of the face and you have to respect the aesthetic units of the face. Uh, a defect of more than one centimeter, like this question, four centimeter by four centimeter, can to be sutured primary. It will cause a very high tension and will gap after that. So, the primary closure won't be an option. Even the split thickness graft is not preferred in the face. If you are insisting on giving a flap, uh, a graft in the face, Use the full thickness instead of the split thickness. The pedicle mycotinous flab for a 4 cm is overrated option for the face and doesn't respect the aesthetic unit. Use the reconstruction ladder. So after the graft, which is not applicable here, you have to try the local rotational flap. It will be a very promising result. A very famous recall which is manipulative, talking about a dog who has uh, bit the nose of somebody and asking you about the option to be done to manage this patient. The trick in this equation, when 
are we talking? Are we talking about the event itself when he is coming in the ER? If he came to you in the ER the day of the bite from the from the dog, please consider giving him the anti rabies and the anti tetanus, and uh, consider excision of the wound and debridement, aggressive debridement. And later on, you can uh, reconstruct the nose after uh, continuous head medication and cleaning up the wound bed. So, the reconstruction for the nose by a forehead flap, for example, and very famous uh, forehead flap, you must have seen it, especially in India, your uh, literature and ancient ages talked about this uh, reconstruction historically. So, at the time of the event, Consider deep pridement after the dog bite. There is no primary reconstruction after a dog bite. Brilocaine is a recognized cause of methoglobinemia. This is characterized by the development of cyanosis, dizia, and this disorder occurs because the change of hemoglobin to a ferric subtype rather than ferrous. This type of change shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the left and tissue hypoxia occur. Methylene blue will reverse the hemoglobin to the ferrous type and reverse this effect. Again, the methylene blue will reverse the hemoglobin to the ferrous type and reverse this effect. The prelocane antidote will be methylene blue. So when you are giving PR block for hand exam examination or hand surgery, you will give prelocane. And if you want to reverse its action, you will take intravenous methylene blue. Remember that the lignocaine antidote is intralibid. Remember, the lignocaine antidote will be the intralibid. Remember that we talked about that cell saver is inappropriate in case of infection or case of cancer and malignancy. Remember that the incidence of post-operative wound dehiscence is minimized by the following Jenkins rule, which advocates the mass closure of the midline wound. However, the suture strength is an important consideration, and the 3 O suture doesn't have sufficient tensile strength. Both pyridoxan, the BDS, and polyproline or nylon ethylone are all equally suitable. Although separate closure of the peritoneum was practiced, it has no bearing on the incidence of abdominal wound dehiscence. Nobody closes the peritoneum right now, so just follow the Jenkins rule. COSA system, the COSA system, minimizes thermal injury and current flow to the surrounding area. That's why it's preferred in the brain surgeries. The COSA is the short for Cavitron Ultrasound Surgical Aspirator. Again, Cavitron Ultrasound Surgical Aspirator in the COSA. To cut out a print tumor without adversely affecting the surrounding healthy tissue, the entire device is embedded with an irrigator and aspirator in order to dispose uh, the tissue debris. It's commonly used by the neurosurgeons. For splenic bleeding, the argon plasma coagulation system is very good for managing the splenic bleeding. Alternative will be including topical hemostatic agent. It's all too necessary to ligate the higher vessels of this required a splenectomy is the usual outcome. Of course you know that Watson fund application is uh, a fund application for anti reflux procedure, right? The fund application is anti reflux procedure. You might be familiar with the Nesson fund application, but Watson is also a good option for the anti reflux surgeries the GERD surgeries. By the way, most of the anti-reflux surgeries are done now by laparoscopic surgeries. Almost all surgeries are done now via laparoscopic surgeries. Remember that vulgaration typically avoids the contact between the electrode and the tissue. That's why it's vulgar away from the tissue, with the current configured to favor the arc formation. The desiccation in contrast to vulgaration, the desiccation it's active electrode in direct contact with the tissue. It's low current, high voltage, and result in loss of the cellular water, but no protein damage. In the desiccation, there is no protein damage. 
The tubercle bacilli has a waxy outer membrane that renders it more resistant to sterilization and cleaning method. While the sodium hydrochloride will destroy many microbes, uh, it less reliable to destroy the tubercle bacilli. While the hot air oven provides less reliable pathogenic structure than the autoclaving, but may be indicated in situation where the equipment is sensitive to the autoclaving process. For the list option, autoclaving will be most reliable to destroy the tubercle bacilli. Remember that in autoclaving, the air is removed and high pressure steam used, usually around 134 cc for about 3 minutes at least. Uh, most reusable surgical equipment are in autoclaved and must be physically clean prior to autoclaving. It's unsuitable for the fragile items. Take care, because it uses steam. Remember that glutaraldehyde is a colorless oily liquid and directly cytocidal and uh, vericidal even at low temperature. It is specifically used for endoscopes and some laparoscopic items stuff and can rapidly develop allergy if used without if the equipment is used with the glutaraldehyde on it. So before using the endoscope, please remove the glutaraldehyde from the endoscopy and laparoscopic equipment because it will develop allergy. And this substance, which has limited, is more widespread use. So glutaraldehyde is very abundant and common use for endoscope and laparoscope. In circumcision, please use bipolar or often use bipolar whenever you can uh, because the monopolar may cause a very devastating result. It will cause the penis to cut off during circumcision and uh, be mummified. Yes, it will necrose and cut off. If you are not familiar with the suturing materials, know that the suturing material above the zero 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, without mentioning any zero, you are thickening the filament. But when you are talking about 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, the higher the number, the thinner is the filament. So 10, 0 is the finest of all sutures used in the microsurgery. But when you are talking about 5, without mentioning any zero, it's very, very, very thick. Again, above the zero, without mentioning any zero, like one, two, three, four, five, five will be thicker than one. But when you are talking about one zero and ten zero, the ten zero is very thin compared to one zero. Okay? The laminar flow theater aims to reduce the number of infective organisms in the theater by generating a continuous flow of bacteria free air. In laminar flow theater, air may be changed in the theater more than 300 times per hour compared to standard positive pressure theater, which is rate from 15 to 25 air change per hour. A surgical rule, whenever pleading, please use pressure prior to anything you can do. Press on the pressure and stop the pleading, then think what you can do. If you hit a vessel, so you can repair this vessel either with proline 500 proline suturing or if the skin, you can diatherm the subcutaneous uh, via bipolar uh, more, than, uh, pro, uh, more than convenient than diathermy. And uh, if you have a bleeder, you can suture it via figure of 8. It will be more um, appropriate, I think, to suture it figure of 8. Right? While studying statics, please don't pressure yourself. Take it piecemeal. Know the idea. Don't stress yourself. And just know the idea of the question. And that's it. By revision and repetition, you will get all the ideas you need in stats. Please don't exhaust yourself in the exam because the stats about 3 to 4 questions maximum. Okay? Stats. The Z-score, the Z-score is determined using the normal distribution and is not a descriptive statics. From the descriptive statics, the mean, median, mood, standard deviation, but never the Z-score.
The face is our image, and we have aesthetic units in our face. So, if someone has a wound or a raw area in the face, we have to follow the reconstruction ladder. But take care in the face, we don't prefer grafting. And if you have to take a graft and make it uh, in the face, use the full thickness graft. But try using the local flap first. Especially in the cartilaginous areas like the ear and nose. When you have the nose exposed cartilage, try to use a flap to cover because the cartilage we mostly prefer to cover it with the flap. Unfortunately, the MRCS and the UK guidelines uh, doesn't respect the plastic opinions and controversies. That's why you have to know that a very famous recall question about a chain of tibia which is exposed and asking you about coverage. The chain of tibia for the, the plastic surgeon is a bone. And we don't prefer to cover the bone with graft. Even if the preosteum is preserved, we try to do a flap, either free or local flap, and in the chain of tibia, mostly we require a flap. But in MRCS, we will follow the guidelines of the UK, which is stating that graft can be put, the split sickness graft can be put on uh, a bone which is preserving the periosteum. Hope this point is clear. Confirm me if it's clear. The bone is preserving the periosteum, you can put a split second graft. The tendon, if preserving the parakinon, you can put a split second graft. This is the UK guidelines. However, we plastic surgeons may be uh, giving a graft for a parakinon, but for the periosteum, I prefer, and the most of the plastic surgeon prefer flap. But the UK guidelines, graft. When we have a venous leg ulcer, the typical management will be usage of compression bandage. The contraindication of using this technique, the compression bandage, include peripheral vascular disease. According to the UK guideline, local anesthetic avoid usage of adrenaline extremities like the fingers and the toes because they are end arteries. However, for your own knowledge, you have to know that the Wallen technique, which is a wide awake local anesthetic surgeries, might use the adrenaline with uh, some uh, dissolution and some uh, preparation. But according to the UK guidelines, just stick to it that you are using the local anesthetic without adrenaline in the extremities, like the fingers and the toes. The T-tube is a draining tube placed in, placed in the common pile duct of our common pile duct exploration with the supraduodenal cholecystectomy. It provides external drainage of the pile into a controlled route while healing process of the cholecystectomy uh, is maturing and the original pathology is resolving. In neonate analgesia, parastamol is an effective analgesic in children and pain following hemiotomy is relatively uh, minor. So note that choregene is contraindicated in neonate and the child is too young to receive apoprofen. Open resection of splenic flexure cancer will require a long midline incision and carries a potential for respiratory compromisation. And this, uh, this is best encountered uh, with placement of epidural anesthesia. An alternative would be a rectus cheese catheter infiltrated of local anesthetic and BCA. The BCA is a modern method of pain relief in which the patient controls the amount of pain medication that it used. When pain relief is needed, the patient can receive a preset dose of pain medicine by pressing a button on his hand on a computerized pump or mechanical pump that is connected to a small tube in his body wherever the analgesia is, desi is desired. It's called patient controlled analgesia, PCEA. In case of you don't know, the inguinal hernia repair might be done under local anesthesia right now and have a very short operative time and patients are usually ambulant immediately after birth. You have to try it if you are a general surgeon. His family history is unlikely to be significant and has very low risk for uh, thromboprophylaxis, so low dose of low molecular weight, heparin and pneumatic compression will be enough. The intralipid, intralipid emulsion 
is the antidote for lidocaine or lignocaine. Central lines are a very common cause for developing of pneumothorax and whenever you are uh, asked in the exam about a case of um, respiratory compromisation after central line think of pneumothorax and think of the cause of the pneumothorax might be the central line. In the context of positive pressure ventilation, a tension pneumothorax is a strong possibility and would be associated with hemodynamic instability, especially with the uh, subclavian line of the central line. Vasopressin is released in increased quantities following most operative procedure and will tend to cause water retention. For this reason, excessive administration of intravenous fluid is an attempt to force diuresis may cause fluid overload in both the operative patient. Again, was present released in increased in, uh, intraoperative and post-operative procedure and stress uh, in general. For this reason, excessive administration of IV fluids uh, to force diuresis may cause fluid overload in both the operative patient. Aortic dissection is associated with the third trimester of a pregnancy. And connective tissue disorder like Marfan or Ehlers Danlos syndrome and bicuspid valve is very common to have aortic dissection. Patient may complain of tearing chest pain, tearing very, very tearing chest pain and syncope, syncope which is sudden loss of conscious. Clinically, they may be hypertensive. The right coronary artery may become involved in the dissection, causing myocardial infarction in up to 2% of the cases. And that's why the ST elevation in the inferior leads might be presented. An aortic regurgitation murmur may be auscultated as well in those patients. Remember that mitral stenosis in most cases associated with rheumatic heart disease and is becoming less, um, less common in British um, countries. Unlike our countries, still have the rheumatic heart disease in uh, third world countries as they name it uh, due to poor socioeconomic status. Uh, common cardiac condition in pregnancy is the mitral stenosis and commonly associated with mortality and valve surgery balloon valvoplasty preferable to treat the mitral stenosis. Balmoni embolism is the leading cause of mortality in pregnancy and it's treated by low molecular weight heparin from four to six weeks uh, after childbirth and remember that warfarin is contraindicated in pregnancy. When a red fracture causes pneumothorax, there must be a laceration to the underlying lung parenchyma. This has a risk of developing into tension pneumothorax and for this reason a chest drain should be inserted in the patient when he admitted. And the chest drain now is administered in the fifth intercostal space mid axillary line according to the ATL instance edition protocol. And the first action to be done in pneumothorax if suspected is white bore camera to be inserted in the fifth mid axillary space in the mid axillary line in adult, but in children is still the second. So remember in adult, fifth mid axillary line, fifth space mid axillary line, but in children and neonates and children in the second intercostal space mid clavicular line a very tricky question because it depends on the knowledge of the ATLS protocol 10th edition be care in the question of the exam he is asking about the first to do or the definitive management the definitive management is a drain the first to do is decompression cannula it may be a very new concept for all of you to know that in pregnancy after a high energy trauma and suspecting internal restoration in a pregnant woman, you will do CT. Yes, you will do an urgent abdominal CT scan for a pregnant because the fastest scan associated with false negative rate in pregnancy which makes the negative result less assuring. So CT scanning remains the gold standard in this patient. Even in, in some question, he want to mention directly that the patient is circumferentially burned. You have to be logic that 60% burn is most probably covering circumferential burn of the torso and the back and the limbs as well. And you have to do escarotomy. It's like incision in the escars of the burn to release. And um, for the limb, escarotomy prevent 
the compartmental syndrome. In the torso and in the chest, you will facilitate the ventilation for the patient. It's clear that when you are suspecting intracranial hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage, you have to be suspecting the patient to be hypertensive. But when you are finding the patient is hypotensive, you must think of hypovolemic shock due to internal hemorrhage, intravisceral hemorrhage. The cushion triad where we are suspecting intracranial pressure increasing due to intracranial breathing, you will find the patient hypertensive, bradycardic, and with respiratory depression. The cushion triad. Yes, mitral stenosis will cause a mid-diastolic murmur, which may be difficult to escalate unless the patient is placed into the left lateral position. The patient are risk of atrial fibrillation AF up to 40%, which can be also contributing to rapid decompensation, such as pulmonary edema. That's why the white out of the lung term used. Physiological change in pregnancy may cause an otherwise asymptomatic patient to suddenly deteriorate. He will be well and good and suddenly will be deteriorating. A balloon valvoplasty is a treatment of choice in these cases. When traumatic aortic disruption happens and the patient doesn't die on the scene of the action of the RTA, for example, he may have a contained hematoma. And the clinical signs are supple and the diagnosis may not apparent on clinical examination. So without treatment of the hematoma usually persist and the patient will die eventually again. The thoracic aortic rupture, chest X-ray changes. You will find a widened mediastine. The trachea and the surfaces will be shifted to the right and depression of the left main stem bronchus. Wide Baratracheal stripe and paraspinal interface. The space between aorta and pulmonary artery will be obliterated, and rib fractures and left hemothorax might be present in the chest x ray. The aortic rupture um, usually is diagnosed by angiography and CT and uh, aortogram, and the treatment of choice will be endovascular repair, emergent, immediate, in, in fact. Dear friend, whatever your specialty is, don't confuse the term when you hear aortic rupture or aortic dissection. They are two distinct terms. Aortic rupture is the breakage of the aorta. Aortic rupture is the breakage of the aorta. Aortic dissection is there through the inner wall of the aorta. They can block the flow from uh, the aorta to the heart and the abdominal organs. So the Stanford classification for the dissection is unlike the aortic rupture. This is something that is another thing. A calamity of the cardia may produce severe chest pain and many older patients may undergo cardiac investigation prior to endoscopy. And the endoscopic injection with petroleum toxin is popular treatment right now, although the benefit is not long lasting because the petroleum toxin will last mostly for about six months at least. At max, cardiomyotomy uh, together with anti reflexive procedure is the most durable alternative for treating achalasia of the cardia. In achalasia of the cardia, is difficulty swelling due to dysphagia to both liquid and solid, and sometimes will cause chest pain, usually caused by failure of the distal esophageal inhibitor neurons, the problem in the distal part of the esophagus. And the diagnosis is by uh, the pH manometry uh, together with contrast swallowing and endoscopy. So, to diagnose achalasia of the cardia, pH manometry and contrast swallow and endoscopy. The treatment, bituronum toxin and pneumatic dilatation or cardiomyotomy. Cardiomyotomy is very preferable for achalasia. Again, let's remember that brilocaine antidote will be methylene blue and the lidocaine antidote will be the intralipid 20%. To remember the Glasgow Coma Scale easily, you have to remember that the motor will be 6 mark and the verbal will be 5 mark and the eye opening responses will be 4 mark. The total will be 15. So remember that the motor 6 and verbal 5 and eye will be 4. Why is that? We 
many times if you are not practicing emergency medicine might forget it so you remember that motor six verbal five and eye opening will be four the next track in Glasgow comma scale that there is no zero in Glasgow comma scale you have to use one if no response no motor response one no verbal response one no eye opening will no response will be one and the least score in the Glasgow comma scale will be three there is no zeros there is no one there is no two you will have at least three if the patient is dead will take three the next track in Glasgow comma scale if eight intubate if the patient Glasgow comma score is eight please go will intubation the next Tibetan track in Glasgow comma scale if he is opening his eye spontaneously and verbally responding and oriented with time, place and person and motor response obeying command will be 6. So we'll have the full mark if he is doing everything spontaneously. So in eye opening we have finished two of the scores, spontaneous and no response. Spontaneously we'll get 4, no response will get 1. So add the pain and the speech. He will open his eye in response to pain, will get two score instead of one, he is not dead. And he is obeying your orders and according to your speech, opening your eye, opening his eye and not spontaneously, take care. He is opening his eye in response to your speech, will get three, because the four will be spontaneously. Now the verbal response, we have finished two out of five. If no response will take one, if he is dead will take one, if he having no uh, verbal response will take one, but he is oriented with time, place and person will be five. Now we have three left. If the patient is talking with incomprehensible sound, uh, uh, incomprehensible sounds, you can't understand a word, so he will take two, because he is not dead, he is giving you voices. But if he is telling you inappropriate word in response, so this will be taking three. If the patient is confused, will be four. Pay attention to the motor response. It might be tricky for many. We have finished two out of six. The first, if he is not responding and the patient is dead, will take one. If he is obeying your command, uh, according to your uh, command, if you are telling the patient to flex his arm, extend his arm, raising his arm up, raising his down, uh, down, he is obeying command, will take six. Now we have four remnant score in motor response. If he is doing abnormal extension, he is decelerated and will take two. If he is doing abnormal flexion, will take three because he is decorticated. If he is doing flexion, withdrawal from pain, he will take four. He is good. Flexion, he is defending himself. So he will take four. But again, abnormal extension, he is hopeless. Letting himself down. He is decelerated will take two. The trick always in flexion and extension. And the flexion, withdrawal and the abnormal flexion. But if he is moving to localize the pain, he is better than all of those because he is eager to defend himself and localize the pain. Will take five. If he localize the pain, will take five. If he is flexion withdrawal from the pain, flexing withdrawing your hand from the pain, will take four. If he is doing just the flexion but not localizing the pain or near from it, can't de defend himself, will take only three. But he is doing extension he can't defend himself he is disrepreted and will take two hope this sum up the glasgow coma scale if you case forget it in case of the patient who have sick a thyroid syndrome all thyroid parameters are reduced in grave disease and levothyroxine will cause hyperthyroidism this will cause low tsh and elevate thyroxine t3 while in Hashimoto thyroidites is associated with hypothyroidism and high TSH and low thyroxine T3.
The sick eugothyroid syndrome is now referred to as non-thyroidal illness. It's often said that even everything TSH, thyroxine, T3 will be low. Uh, in the majority of the cases, however, the TSH level might be within normal range. It's inappropriate normal given the low thyroxine and T3. Splenic trauma. If the patient have a small subcapsular hematoma with minimal intra-abdominal blood and no hilar disruption, go with conservative treatment. But if he have increased amount of intra-abdominal blood and bodily hemodynamic compromisation, tear of the laceration less than 50%, uh, you can do laparotomy with conservation, but your drains and might have secondary look or secondary reassessment. But if the patient have hilar injury, with major hemorrhage and major associated injury, consider resection of the spleen. But intraoperative during laparotomy, if you are going to conserve, don't mobilize the spleen, because if you going to mobilize the spleen, you will disrupt the hematoma formation and you will be going to create a massive pool of hemorrhage. So you will be eventually going to splenectomy. So don't trouble the trouble until the trouble troubles you. Indications for hemicraniotomy include age under 60 years and clinical deficits in the middle cerebral artery territory and decreased consciousness and more than 50% territory in FARC. If you are suspecting intracerebral hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage and gave the patient an anticoagulation therapy, if you are not going to do surgery, you might cause harming of the patient and increase the hemorrhage liability. So please, first go for surgery and then consider the antiblated or anticoagulation measurements, especially in intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage. When you are suspecting cardiac camponade, you will find a pec triad, elevated venous pressure, reduced arterial pressure and reduced heart sound. Again, in back strand, when you are considering suspicions of cardiac tamponade, back strand will be elevated venous pressure, reduced arterial pressure, reduced heart sound, and you will see pulses paradoxicus, and may occur with little as 100 cc blood around the heart. Myocardial infarction is traditionally described as a sudden onset of central crushing chest pain you have never experienced it before. It might radiate to the neck and now down to the left arm. Signs of autonomic dysfunction may be present. The presenting feature may be atypical in the elderly and those with diabetes. The silent killer will be diabetes to have MI. Diagnosis is made through the identification of new unusual dynamic ECG changes. The inferior and anterior infarct may be distinguished by the presence of specific ECG changes, usually in 2, 3 and AVF for inferior leads and V1 to V5 for the anterior leads. So the inferior, the changes will be in 2, 3 and AVF, while the inferior MI will be V1 to V5 for the anterior. Treatment with oral antiplatelet agent and primary coronary angioplasty and thrombolysis. A funny mnemonic regarding the Lefort classification. Grade 1, speak no evil. Grade 2, see no evil. Grade 3, hear no evil. Look at the diagram and you will understand this. The criteria for immediate request of CT. Loss of conscious lasting more than 5 minutes and you have witnessed those 5 minutes. Amnesia for more than 5 minutes. Abnormal drowsiness, 3 or more discrete episodes of vomiting, not just once. Clinical suspicion of non-accidental injury. Both traumatic seizures but no history of epilepsy. If the glasgocoma scale is less than 14 or for a baby under one year with glasgocoma scale less than 15 on assessment in the emergency department. If you are suspecting an open or depressed fracture injury 
or uh, tensifontanel in the PB in you need. Any sign of basal skull fracture, the hemotympanum, and the eye, cerebrospinal fluid leakage from the ear, nose, battle sign, a halo sign, focal neurological deficit, and if under one year present of bruises, swelling, or laceration of more than 5 cm on the head, consider CT. Dangerous mechanism of injury, like high speed RTA, road traffic accident, either in pedestrian or cyclist or vehicle, a vehicle uh, occupant or fall from height greater than 3 meter or a high speed injury, consider CT scanning. Again, loss of consciousness more than 5 minutes, amnesia more than 5 minutes. If he vomited more than 3 times, less of coma scale is impaired or less than 15 or high energy trauma. Full sickness burn involves complete injury to the epidermis, derms, and subdermal appendages. They will have a leathery oven appearance. And in the exam, might tell you that he have crustaceans. They are initially insensate, although pain often occurs during healing process and during skin grafting, but he is insensate. The third degree burn, different from the partial degree burn, because the fourth sickness, third degree burn, has no sensation. Presence of blisters is specific for second degree burn. In first degree burn is like the sun burn, or you will find only high premium without any plus, without any blisters. And first and second degree burn are painful. And when you find pain, it's a blessing, because you feel it. You still have your sensory innervation. Unlike the third degree burn, he doesn't feel. And this is unfortunately a bad sign. Escarotomy is not fasciotomy. You have to differentiate between escarotomy and fasciotomy. Escar is a sick coagulated crust slough which develops following a burn injury or a chemical or physical cauterization of the skin. In full thickness, Circumferential burn, coagulation, coagulant, um, act as a tourniquet, leading to vascular compromisation and up to compartmental syndrome affecting the body parts. Escarotomy is incision of the escar itself, of this coagulated crust, for decompression and de uh, the constrictive effect caused by the deep circumferential burn. Fasciotomy is a surgery to relieve the swelling and the pressure in the compartment itself of the body. Tissues that surround the area is cut open to relieve the pressure. Fasciotomy is the most often needed in leg and uh, less likely in hand, but if needed will be done. But don't confuse fasciotomy with escarotomy. Simply, simply again, escarotomy is opening the escar, the coagulated skin, but the fasciotomy is opening the fascia of the compartment that holds the compartment of the muscle to decrease the compartmental syndrome. Initial management of hyperkalemia, which is known for its hyperacuity, will be intravenous calcium gluconate. The changes of ECG in hyperkalemia will be peak T wave or hyperacuity, prolonged PR segment, loss of P wave and prolonged QRS complex and ST segment might be slightly elevated and ectopic beat or escape beat rhythm may be found. So mainly stress on hyperacuity for hyperkalemia and the initial management will be calcium gluconate. Borheif syndrome, the rupture of the esophagus is often on the left side. The rupture of the esophagus in Borheif syndrome and most probably on the left side. Borheif syndrome, Borheif syndrome, it's a spontaneous rupture of the esophagus. Most probably will be on the left side. Caused by episodes of repeated vomiting and often associated with alcoholic. Typically, the episodes of re repeated vomiting followed by severe chest pain and epigastric pain. Diagnosed by CT and contrast study. Treatment is surgical during the first 12 hour primary repair. Beyond this 12 hour, first 12 hour, beyond this repair, 
the usually will be controlled fistula with a T-tube delayed beyond 24 hours. It's always associated with fulminant mediastinitis and usually fatal case. It missed. So if the patient told you that he is vomiting, vomited a lot and he is alcoholic with chest pain, please think of Borrell syndrome. In microsurgery, the degloved injury, uh, if the skin quality is good, we can reattach it. But for MRCS, let's stick with their rules. The degloving injury is most probably due to friction injury, so they consider removing of this skin and sticking with grafting the raw area degloved from the skin. Good day, dear great surgeons. Many have been asking the frequent past days, can they pass MRCS by starting right now? We are two months and a half away from the exam. The answer is simply yes. If you are dedicated to the exam plan and the materials required for this exam and the exam style without hesitation and without distraction to any um, expected plans in your mind other than what is required for this exam, this exam has keys and uh, fortunately we have been sharing our keys together all over uh, generation towards generation. So just to stick to the plan and keep your mind free, be motivated every day, uh, pray and don't be distracted, yes you can. You are not alone, we are all together in this and together we can. And if anyone needs any help in, by any means, just write on the group, in our study group or in private, whenever the message will be read by anybody, we will support each other and we can solve uh, what the problem and what uh, points require improvement. Don't compare your chapter 1 with anybody's uh, progress. You don't know how he fought during his fight to reach his level. And you also, you have your own fights. We all have our own fights. So let's keep pushing each other forward and move forward towards a joyful success with the grace of God. Thank you, dear friend. Do you know if you have gone through our Facebook group initiation, you will find the initiators of the group and the founders of the group were lost until uh, about uh, it was one month away from the exam when they knew what to study and how to study one month away from the exam and for me I didn't have the chance to study all the records because I didn't believe they come in the exam until two weeks my uh, friends on the group insisted that I have to do it with them I didn't know how to do it and how to collect them and how to understand them and how to discuss them uh, miraculously they supported me and I supported them we all we were all in this together. I can remember uh, every one of them in the exam. I have remembered our discussions. We didn't have um, activities on our Telegram group, as you can see, uh, back then in my exam. Uh, even it was uh, to be beneficial. But I remember every one of them and every comment anyone have commented in, in a question was tricky and came in the exam. You are your own power, you are your own motivator. Together, you can do it, like all the teams have passed with us before. Embrace yourself and believe in yourself. And now you are knowing the trick and we are telling you our tricks and our experience. And we are not hiding anything until the RCS change their plan of their exam, then we can talk. But with their plans and the RCS, uh, MRCS exam style. This is the exam style and we will study according to the exam style. And you know it now, at least two months away from the exam, if not two months and a half. And if you have started the schedule from the beginning, you are having the luxury to start the plan 100 days at least from the, from the exam. Believe in yourself, believe in your God, 
who have started this journey with you and you can do it because God is good and you deserve to be good you are a surgeon and never forget it God be with you dearest friend Naloxone is the antidote for opiate toxicity Naloxone has the quickest onset of action however it's important to be aware that its short acting duration and the need for further administration uh, there is also risk of rebound pain uh, once naloxone is given take care if pulmonary embolism is not in your mind you will miss it for sure so chest pain hypoxia and clear chest uh, on auscultation in a pregnant woman should lead to a high suspicion of pulmonary embolism CT is the most sensitive uh, investigation for abdominal trauma uh, survey. However, it's not the primary survey. And if the patient is hemodynamically stable with no major associative injury suspected, ultrasound will be sufficient enough to detect any free fluid intra-abdominal. And if any suspicious uh, or any clear fluid intra-abdominal after a major trauma, you may consider CT to assess the trauma well. In compartmental syndrome, this will result in muscle breakdown and release of myoglobin, which will accumulate in the kidney and cause multi-organ failure and renal failure. So compartmental syndrome will give rise to myoglobin, will cause myoglobinuria and also will cause hyperkalemia from the muscle uh, breakdown. By the way, in compartmental syndrome, never wait until the pulse is not felt to say it's compartmental syndrome. This is the least dependable sign and is a very common record question. Don't wait until the pulse is not felt to confirm that it's compartmental syndrome. Rely on your clinical suspicions and your clinical examination and the circumstances of the injury. Vertigo and dysarthria suggest a posterior circulation event. The patient complaining of posterior symptoms and sudden deterioration in consciousness, the main differential diagnosis is the basal artery occlusion. In anterior circulation in park, it will include the middle and anterior cerebral arteries, which will lead to a hemiparesis and hemisensory loss, a homonymous hemianopia in the eye vision, and higher cognitive dysfunction, dysphasia, anterior circulation in FARC, TACI, or TACI, 15%, it involves middle and anterior cerebral arteries, will cause hemiparesis, homonymous hemianopia, and high cognitive dysfunction, like dysphasia. If you are a plastic surgeon, the talking about the blisters in second degree burn might be confusing while taking MRCS, but let's be stick to the MRCS rules. A 5 cm blister, it's a large area for MRCS and the roofing of the blister and reviewing of the patient in outpatient clinic is the main stay for MRCS examination. Remember the word scarotomy is indication in circumferential for thickness burn to the torso and the limb, not the second degree burn. In circumferential for thickness burn, not the second degree burn. When you are suspecting CSF leakage like CSF rhinorrhea or CSF otorrhea, beta-2 transferrin is a carbohydrate-free form of transferrin that is almost exclusively found in CSF. In the past, traditionally, uh, glucose was used and associated with false positive result, a secondary to contamination with other glucose-contaminated bodily secretion. Uh, another clinical sign you might find in uh, CSF leak rhinorrhea, a halo sign. A halo sign will define the CSF leak from the uh, nose secretion and the blood because it will cause uh, like a halo around the RPC uh, bleeding. It will be uh, much distinctive if you have seen it once. Lactic shock. You have to suspect it if patient have been exposed to an allergen and manifested with uh, allergy and uh, hypersensitivity. Please, first, remove the allergen. Second, do a primary survey A, B, C, D and do drug give adrenaline 1 over 1000. I am not IV, 
you can repeat this after five minutes if no response. Then you can give chlorophenamine or hydrocortisone or whatever. But first, adrenaline, one over thousand IM. One over thousand IM for anaphylactic shock. Addisonian crisis. What are the causes for Addisonian crisis? First, sepsis or surgery causing an acute exacerbation of chronic insufficiency like Addison or hypopituitarism. Adrenal hemorrhage like uh, water Friedreich syndrome or fulminant meningococcemia or steroid sudden withdrawal. How to manage an Addisonian crisis? First, give hydrocortisone 100 mg IM or IV. One liter of normal saline is infused over 30 to 60 minutes or with dextrose if hypoglycemic. Continue hydrocortisone 6 hourly until the patient is stable. No fluidocortisone is required because high cortisone exerts a weak mirage cortisone action. Oral replacement may begin after 24 hours and be reduced to maintenance over 3 to 4 days. Visceral cavity rewarming is the fastest rapid rewarming technique, either through lung or abdomen or both. Only extracorporeal circulation device provide faster rate of rewarming. Hypothermia is defined when the core body temperature is below 35 Celsius. Severe hypothermia is present when the core temperature is below 28 Celsius. Hypothermia uh, is associated with reduced both respiratory and cardiac activity. This may cause um, are complicated by the presence of the alcohol intoxication. The management of hypothermia depends on the degree of the hypothermia. The rewarming technique will depend on the degree of hypothermia. Mind hypothermia will respond to external rewarming device, but severe hypothermia might require an active rewarming technique, such as peritoneal lavage, hemodialysis, or cardiac bypass. But patients who develop cardiac arrhythmia who are severely hypothermic may respond to something which is sadly no longer available in most centers, like the Britellium tosylate. Uh, but don't generally respond to standard therapy or DC cartoversion either. By the way, the J wave are pathognomonic for hypothermia and ECG. Although we have stressed that pulmonary impulse must be a clinical suspicion, but let's talk about the ECG changes in pulmonary impulse. It might come with no changes at all, or S1, Q3, T3. Total R wave V1, P pulmonal peak P wave, inferior leads, right axis deviation, right bundle branch block, or atrial arrhythmias, T wave inversion in V1, 2, 3, and right ventricular strain. If identified, is associated with adverse short term outcome and adds prognostic value to the echocardiography evidence of the right ventricular dysfunction in patient with acute pulmonary impulse and normal blood pressure. This is about the right ventricular strain. Management of acute coronary syndrome. The NIS produced guideline in 2010 and the management of unstable angina and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, the non stim they advocated the management patient based on the early risk assessment using recognized scoring system, such as GRACE, the Global Registry of Acute Cardiac Event, to calculate a predicted six months' mortality. So, the management of acute coronary syndrome. All patients should receive aspirin 300 mg and nitrate or morphia to relieve the chest pain if required. The management of acute coronary syndrome or patient require aspirin 300 mg and nitrate for uh, or morphine to relieve chest pain if required. What also can be given to manage acute or coronary syndrome uh, beside aspirin and nitrates and morphia? Oxygen and antithrombin treatment. Clobidogrel 300 should be given 
in the patient with predicted six months mortality if more than 1.5% uh, or patient who may undergo percutaneous coronary intervention within 24 hours of admission to the hospital. Clobidogrel should be continued for 12 months. But we have as well the um, intravenous glycoprotein uh, receptor antagonists like the tirofiban and uh, ebiftabid uh, should be given to the patient who have intermediate or high risk adverse car cardiovascular event which predicted six months mortality about three percent and who are scheduled to undergo angiography within 96 hours of hospital admission in management of acute coronary syndrome the antithrombin treatment like low molecular weight heparin should be offered to patients who are not at high risk of bleeding and who are not having angiography within the 24 hours. If angiography is likely within 24 hours or the patient creatinines above um, 265 uh, uh, international mole, unfractionated heparin should be given. Patients with significant mediastinal and lung injuries are best operated on using a clamshell thoracotomy. All modes of action involve a degree of compromisation. In this patient, it's a life-saving. A sternotomy would give good access to the heart. However, it takes longer to perform and doesn't provide good access to the lung. Trauma should not be managed using laparoscopy. Bankart lesion is an injury to the anterior inferior glenoid labrum of the shoulder due to anterior shoulder dislocation. When this happens, a pocket at the front of the glenoid forms that allow the humeral head to dislocate it. Uh, the anterior dislocation are the most common type of uh, shoulder dislocation. When recurrent, a Bankart lesion is the most common under underlying abnormality. It's usually visualized by CT, MRI scanning, and often required um, arthroscopic management. The hill sac lesion or hill sac fracture is a cortical depression in the posterior lateral head of the humerus. It results from forceful impaction of the humeral head against the anterior inferior glenoid rim when the shoulder is. Remember this phrase: the Glasgow Coma Scale. If eight intubate, if eight intubate. Anticoagulation will worsen the compartmental syndrome. Take care. Anticoagulation will worsen the compartmental syndrome and make it more bad. Orbital apex syndrome. This is extension of superior orbital fissure syndrome and includes compression of optic nerve passing through the optic foramen. It's indicated by the features of superior orbital fissure syndrome and ipsilateral afferent pupillary defect. The features of uh, superior orbital fissure syndrome are complete ophthalmoplegia and ptosis, including nerve 3, 4, and 6, and nerve 2, levator palpebrae superioris, relative afferent pupillary defect dilatation of the pupil and loss of accommodation of the cornea reflex will cause as well altered sensation from the forehead to the vertex frontal branch of the trigeminal nerve to consider conservation or laboratory conservation in spleen injury it must be small subcuspular hematoma or minimal intra-abdominal blood or even uh, tear or laceration less than 50% of the spleen but if there is a high lead injury with major hemorrhage, this will cause him to bleed to death. Consider splenectomy, please. Take care. High reticulocyte and severe anemia, sickle cell anemia. Low reticulocyte and severe anemia, you might consider barbovirus. Take care of the definition. Reticulocytopenia is low reticulocyte. Reticulocytosis is high reticulocyte. High reticulocyte with sickle cell anemia. Low reticulocyte with virus crisis. Let's review some notes about the sickle cell anemia. 
It's an autosomal recessive and single based mutation. The deoxygenated cell becomes sickle shape, uh, shape like the crescent shape. Uh, what are the causes of sickle cell anemia? The short red cell survival obstruction of microvessels and infarction. The sickling is precipitated by dehydration and infection and hypoxia. So the sickle cell anemia patient doesn't move with a sickle uh, blood cell but if he is exposed to dehydration or infection or hypoxia he will manifest the sickle cell uh, anemia bodies and the deoxygenated cell will become sickle in shape manifest at six months age and uh, african middle east and india more common places diagnosed by hemoglobin electrophoresis the sickle cell crisis will manifest by bone pain, pleuritic chest pain, seizures, babillary necrosis, lenic infarct, priapism, priapism is painful erection, and hepatic pain. Take care. In sickle cell anemia, homoglobin won't fall during a crisis unless there is aplasia due to parvovirus or acute sequestration or hemorrhosis. In sickle cell anemia patient, he will initially have a splenomegaly then after that with uh, with age you will have something called autosplenectomy the spleen will be atrophied self atrophied again thoracic aorta rupture must be a clinical suspicion and chest x-ray finding must be in our mind when you see widened mediastinum and trachea or surface shifted to the right with depression of the left main stem bronchus Widened parenchyma, uh, pretrachea stripe, and parastine, uh, paraspinal interface, or space between the aorta and pulmonary artery is obliterated or rift fracture with left hemothorax. Be suspicious for thoracic aorta rupture. Care in hypocalcemia, calcium chloride and calcium gluconate both can be used. Currently, gluconate is favored agent than chloride, but both can be used. The early development of parathesia and paralysis are signs definite for ischemia presence and immediate exploration and repair if this is due to a trauma is essential. Did you know that the presence of palpable pulse after a trauma doesn't exclude an arterial injury because the presence may be present due to a transmitted pulsation through the blood clot? When severe traumatic ischemia is present, the repair must be completed within 6 to 8 hours to prevent irreversible muscle ischemia and loss of the limb function. Trousse de bois, trousse de bois, the management is magnesium sulfate IV. Trousse de bois, treatment IV magnesium sulfate. Trousse de bois is a rare arrhythmia. It means twisting of the points associated with long QT interval. It may deteriorate into ventricular uh, fibrillation, VF, and hence lead to sudden death. It might be congenital or acquired for QT interval. The management of the trousse de bois IV magnesium sulfate. The macular triad is a triad Definitive for Borheif syndrome suspicious, vomiting, thoracic pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. Again, the macular triad for Borheif syndrome, vomiting, thoracic pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. And you will find in the scenario that the examiner will talk about that the patient is uh, alcoholic, drinking alcohol or vodka, and vomited forcibly, repeatedly at night and tell you the macular triad of vomiting, thoracic pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. So, Borheif syndrome. The v -tech, ventricular tachycardia, is a broad complex tachycardia which originates from the ventricular ectopic focus. There are two main types of v ventricular tachycardia. <coughs> the monomorphic ventricular tachycardia and the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. The most common type is the monomorphic, which is called by 
myocardial infarction. While the polymorphic is a subtype of the polymorphic is the trousse de bois, which is precipitated by prolongation of the QT interval. The causes of the long QT interval uh, are congenital or drugs or others like electrolyte imbalance. Let's stress on the electrolyte imbalance and the causes of the electrolyte imbalance will cause in eventually the ventricular tachycardia like hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. Most of the exam will ask you about the hypomagnesemia because you might miss it. But you know that hypocalcemia, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia will all cause acute interval which will eventually might cause ventricular tachycardia. Other cause the amiodarone and the tricyclic antidepressant and fluoxetine, chloroquine, uh, erythromycin even can cause v -tachy. Congenitally, like the juvenile Lang Nelson, which is deaf and mute uh, patient, uh, due to abnormal potassium challenge and Roman Ward syndrome, where there is no deafness in this uh, syndrome. Again, v -tachy is monomorphic or polymorphic. Trousse de Bois is type of v -tachy. From the electrolyte imbalance that can cause v tachy the hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia. Most commonly asked for hypomagnesemia. And the shortcut syndrome may cause electrolyte imbalance. And from the causes of the electrolyte imbalance due to shortcut syndrome will be hypomagnesemia, which will eventually can cause v tachy You are all great surgeons, but make sure you are not missing the traps. The not trap, the least trap, the except trap, take care. The partial thickness pair are divided into two, superficial and deep. The partial thickness is divided into superficial pair and deep pair. However, uh, it's not possible to initially assess whether it's superficial or deep uh, until a week or two to pass. The dermal appendages are by definition intact in superficial partial thickness burn and will typically heal by re while deeper burn will heal with awful scarring unfortunately. Oculogyric crisis Oculogyric crisis is a dystonic reaction to certain drug or medical condition. It features by restlessness, agitation and involuntary upward deviation of the eye. Causes are phenocyazine, halopridol, metoclopramide, and postcephalitic Parkinson disease, managed by procyclidine. Let's stress on metoclopramide. Many questions will ask you about a patient who has been taking metoclopramide and suddenly he became uh, clenched jaw and eyes deviated upward, and you think of oculogyric crisis. What is with the metoclopramide to do with the oculogyric crisis? Because the metoclopramide is proved to have extra brandon manifestation, especially in children. And many countries have stopped using metoclopramide. Keep it in your mind. Remember that the most common diaphragmatic hernia is bogdalik. Remember that the most common diaphragmatic hernia is Bogdalik diaphragmatic hernia. Bogdalik diaphragmatic hernia, congenital Bogdalik diaphragmatic hernia, Bogdalik P with back, Bogdalik back, while Morgagni anterior, Morgagni anterior, Bogdalik and back. And Bogdalik is the most common diaphragmatic hernia. Just came in mind. The X ray finding for diaphragmatic rupture will be. Hemidiaphragm is not visible, the bowel loops in the lower half of the hemithorax and mediastinum will be displaced. When you hear a bowel loop in the left chest thorax or in the thorax at all, it will be either in a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, missed or traumatic rupture of the diaphragm. Speaking about splenic trauma management you can manage conservatively until the fourth grade. From the fourth grade, start splenectomy, please. Cushing ulcers are associated with a brain tumor or injury and typically are single deep ulcers that are prone to perforation. 
They are associated with high gastric output and are local in the duodenum or stomach. Since burn are associated with the curling ulcer. Curling ulcer is a stress ulcer. It induces ulcer in the stomach or duodenum that occur in relation to a physical stress such as massive burn patient. Delphoid lesion or delafoid lesion is a medical condition characterized by a large tortuous arterial most commonly in the stomach wall, submucosa, that erodes and bleeds. It can present in any part of the gastrointestinal tract. It can cause gastric hemorrhage, massive gastric hemorrhage, but it's relatively uncommon. Remember, penetrating thoracic trauma that's followed by a cardiac arrest is an indication for ER thoracotomy. Again, penetrating thoracic trauma followed by cardiac arrest is indication for ER thoracotomy. For hemostatic transfusion in a major hemorrhage due to trauma especially, advocate the usage of 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, 1 1 1 ratio, 1 fresh frozen plasma to a 1 platelet for a 1 packet RBCs. Circumferential burn may constrict the limb and cause compartmental syndrome to develop and scarotomy is required and compartmental decompression will happen. Intussusception in children can occur between 3 months and 6 years of age, but it's more common in the first 3 years. A colic abdominal pain with straining and leathery a clinical feature and very vasognomonic, the bloody mucus and vomiting, uh, bloody mucus from the anus and vomiting from uh, the mouth occur late when the bowel becomes strangulated and ischemic. The condition involves the telescoping of one segment of bowel into adjacent segment. In management of intussusception, pneumatic or hydrostatic reduction is the therapeutic in most cases, which present within 24 hours. Pneumatic reduction appears to have a higher success rate. The greater plant with nerve arise from T5 to T9 and pass forward and downward on the side of the vertebral bodies. They pierce the crust of the diaphragm and then join the celiac ganglion. Transpyloric plane of Addison is very important at L1 and its constant landmark even in the obese patient. It corresponds to the body of the first lumbar vertebra L1 and number of important structure can be found at this level like the spinal cord end, the origin of superior mesenteric artery, the hilum of the kidney, the origin of portal vein and the gold bladder. The pancreas can be divided into head, neck, body and tail. The head of the pancreas and L2 level vertebra. It overlies the IVC as well as the right and left renal veins and the common bile duct. It's also related to the right cross of the diaphragm. The femoral artery can be palpated at the mid inguinal point against the sous tendon. It's a half away between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis. The femoral artery lateral relation will be femoral nerve and medial relation is the femoral vein and posterior relation the sous tendon. The relations of the bladder are superiorly the sigmoid colon and small intestine and in female the uterus of the female. Anterior to the bladder will be the pubic symphysis and posteriorly the rectum and seminal vesicle, vagina and cervix in female. Laterally, the levator ani and obturator internal muscle. The abdominal portion of the ureter lies on the psoas muscle, which lie over the transverse process of L2 to L5 vertebra, from L2 to L5 vertebra. This is therefore one area where the kidney stone may be seen on the plane film. Care. The cystic artery is direct branch from the right hepatic artery. The right hepatic artery is a branch from the hepatic artery. The hepatic artery is a branch from the celiac trunk. The aorta opens the diaphragm at T12, while the esophagus is T10, and the vena cava with the phrenic nerve at T8. Take care, 
the rupture of spongy urethra result in urine passage into the superficial perineal pouch. And the attachment of perineal fascia mean that rupture of spongy urethra may result in swelling of the scrotum, penis, and subcutaneously into the lower abdominal bowl. Sad's rule for anal fistula or fistula in anal. You have to draw a line crossing through the anus. And if the external opening of the fistula lies behind the line, uh, the curve, the track should curve in a horseshoe manner toward the internal opening in the midline posteriorly. And if the external opening is in front, the transverse line across the anus, it would be direct straight line into the internal opening from it. When we have a swelling in the scrotum and the fact that the cord can be can't be palpated separately suggests that the swelling is arising from above the testicle and the cord. This makes inguinal hernia more likely to be diagnosed. Take care that epididymal cyst and testicular tumor cause scrotal swelling, but cord the cord would be palpated separately from them. Take care and differentiate between gastro cases and exomphalus. The gastro cases there is no covering to the intestine, while exomphalus there is a, a rim of a mutic covering over the intestine. Cryptoorchidism describes the presence of a testicle in the abnormal position. Hirschsprung disease is a case of childhood constipation due to absence of autonomic ganglion cell in the Erbach plexus of the large intestine. In perforate anus is a birth defect in which the rectum is malformed. There is no rectum. There is no anus. There is no anal opening. It's imperforate anus. The upper half of the anal canal is lined by columnar epithelium and the lower half of the canal is lined by squamous epithelium. The lymphatic drainage between the two areas is different. The upper half of the anal canal drains into along the superior rectal vessels to the abdominal nodes, but the lymph drainage for the lower anus is the inguinal lymph nodes. Again, the superior rectal vessels with the upper half to the abdominal uh, lymph nodes, while the lower anus with the inguinal lymph node. The pudendal nerve, the shy nerve. It's supplying the external in a sphincter which is responsible for the continence. While the genitofemoral nerve is a cutaneous supply for the upper side and the pupus of the lip major. While the iliohypogastric nerve is the sensory supply of the suprapubic skin. The inferior gluteal nerve supplies the gluteus maximus muscle. The, obturator, the obturator nerve supplies the medial thigh muscles. Regarding the sacroiliac joint, the common iliac artery usually bifurcates in front of the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is a synovial joint, although it fibroses with increasing age, after menopause in female and aerial in male. The articulating surfaces are jagged and allow little movement due to the strength of the surrounding ligament. The sacral sympathetic trunk descend in the pelvic surface of the sacrum. The sacral sympathetic trunk descend in the pelvic surface of the sacrum. Very famous recall question about a bleeding uh, from an artery which is supplying the sigmoid colon. The blood supply of the sigmoid colon predominantly from the inferior mesenteric artery. And the question in the exam might not ask you about the inferior mesenteric artery, but asking you about the level of the main branch which supplies the sigmoid colon which is bleeding right now. So the anterior branch of the aorta arise at the level of L3 is the inferior mesenteric artery which supplies the sigmoid colon. Remember that the celiac at level of T12, the superior mesenteric artery at level of L1, the inferior mesenteric artery at L3. How to diagnose an obstructed femoral hernia? It's more common in female patient. It's irreducible lump in the left 
groin, a right below, and lateral the pubic tubercle. The inguinal hernia would produce a lump above and medial the pubic tubercle. But the femoral hernia is arise from below a lateral pubic tubercle. If medial and above, this is inguinal hernia. With a patient having a history of hernia, and you see is erythema overlying the site of the hernia, the first thought come to you will be strangulation. It's a very specific early sign. Which organism is in direct contact with the anterior surface of the left kidney without being separated from it by the peritoneum? It's a pancreas. It's a basic anatomy question. The only retroperitoneal structure is the pancreas. The body by which it direct approximation of the left kidney is a pancreas without separation by peritoneum. The adrenaline gland and the colon are also in direct contact with the anterior surface of the left kidney, by the way. The adrenal and the colon are in direct contact with the left kidney. But from the other uh, structures, the pancreas is the retroperitoneum in direct contact with the left kidney without separation by peritoneum. During posterior approach to a hip replacement, the short external rotator of the hip are divided to expose the capsule. The short external rotators are piriformis, trator terrace, and the gemelli. Again, the short external rotators, which are divided to expose the capsule during the posterior approach, piriformis, trator internus, and gemelli. Remember that the duodenum is divided into four sections. The posterior relation of the first part of the duodenum are the portal vein, combined duct, and gastrodenal artery, inferior vena cava, as well behind the first part of the duodenum. The abdominal aorta crosses by the third part of the duodenum, while the superior mesenteric vessel are the anterior relation of the third part of the duodenum. The main pancreatic duct opens in the second part of the duodenum when it joins the common bile duct into the ample of water in the second part. The second part of the duodenum is crossed by the transverse colon. The greater and lesser sac communicate by the epiploic forming of Winslow. The lower border is formed by the first part of the duodenum, while the superior um, lies the caudate loop of the liver. The posterior border is formed by the inferior via cava and the anterior border is formed by the common bile duct hepatic uh, artery and the porter vein. The epiploic formin is important for yes, if any bleeding happen, you have to do bring in maneuver and compress over this epiploic foramen and the anterior border is formed by the common bile duct hepatic artery and portal vein. This will close any bleeding can happen when it happens there. Unfortunately, again, bring a maneuver is when surgeon compresses the hepatic artery where it lies in the anterior wall of the foramen of Winslow, the epiploic foramen. The cystic artery can be damaged in the gallbladder surgery. Take care. The cystic artery is a branch of the right hepatic artery, and the right hepatic artery is branch of the hepatic artery, which is branch of celiac artery. Cystic artery must be identified during cholecystectomy in the triangle of safety. The triangle of callow and normally lies in the triangle formed by the inferior surface of the river and cystic duct and common hepatic duct, uh, also known as the triangle of callow. Bleeding in, uh, is one of the indication of conversion from laparoscopy to open cholecystectomy. And by the way, if any surgeon faced a complication during the cholecystectomy, please call another surgeon to be with you. It's a guideline, not just a recommendation. Do you know that the spleen enlargement occurs along the 10th rep and it's become palpable only if it's at least three times its normal size? And normally, it's about 12 cm long, uh, 7 cm broad, and 4 wide. 12 7 4. 12 7 4. Uh, the spleen is situated between the 9th and the 11th rep, by the way, and along the 10th rep. The lower pool uh, doesn't extend beyond the mid-axillary line. 
Intraoperatively, when you identify the ileocecal junction, you can follow the tinea coli convergence to identify the appendix intraoperatively. The blood supply of the appendix mainly from the appendicular artery, which is a branch from the ileocolic artery, which is a branch from the superior mesenteric artery. The trick in the appendix is that the its base is at constant location, while the tip is not constant at all and have many variation and you have to be oriented with the variation of the tip of the appendix. The base of the appendix is fairly constant at the location posterior middle wall in the cecum about 2.5 cm below the ileocecal valve. Uh, it's the tinea coli convergence as we said. So take care. The base of the appendix is constant while the tip is variable. The blood supply of the rectum is principally derived from the superior rectal arch, which contribute from the middle and the inferior rectal and mediosacral vessels. The lower end of the inferior mesenteric artery enters the sigmoid colon and they change its name into superior rectal artery. And the crossing the pelvic brim, the middle uh, rectal artery are frequently small or absent. The medial sacral artery is also a major, major contributor. Uh, and take care, the vein from the communicating plexus uh, in the submucous internal rectal plexus and the subserosa, the external rectal plexus, those plexus, those plexus drain via the superior rectal vein in the portal vein and via the middle and inferior rectal vein in the anterior iliac vein. Take care, it has portal vein drainage and internal iliac vein drainage portal and systemic drainage that's why pile occur again the inferior mesenteric artery enters the sigmoid mesocolon and it changes its name into superior rectal artery and it's the principal blood supply of the rectum okay the middle rectal artery are frequently small or may be absent the medial sacral artery is minor contributor so the main contributor in blood supply of the rectum is superior rectal artery which is from the inferior mesenteric artery. The inguinal canal is an oblique intermuscular passage through the anterior abdominal wall. A canal in the anterior abdominal wall. It extends from the deep inguinal ring to the external uh, inguinal ring, uh, ring. It's a defect in the fascia transversalis behind and the external oblique anteriorly. In behind, the fascia transversalis defect called the deep inguinal ring, while in, in anteriorly, the, anter the external oblique, the defect is called the external ring. The inguinal canal is about 4 cm long. Its anterior wall is formed by the external oblique abnerosis, assisted with laterally by the portion of the internal uh, oblique muscle and the floor is the roll out of the, in, the rolling in uh, edge of the inguinal ligament and reinforced medially by the lacunar ligament. The roof of the canal formed by the lower edge of the internal oblique and the transversal uh, transverse abdominis. The posterior wall is formed medially by the conjoint tendon. Okay. The soas major and femoral branch of the femoral nerve both pass under the inguinal ligament. And the long saphenous vein terminate in the femoral vein about 3 cm below the inguinal ligament, while the external iliac becomes the common femoral artery at the inguinal ligament. Superficial epigastric vein passes in front of the inguinal ligament. No artery or vein pass under the inguinal ligament. This is because the external iliac vein and artery change their names at the inguinal ligament. It's a border like between the abdomen and the thigh. It's important in anatomy to know from where to start, where to end. The common bile duct, for example, it's formed by the junction of the common hepatic duct and cystic duct and the lie in the free edge of the lesser omentum, anterior to the border vein and the right and to the right of the hepatic artery. Remember, uh, the common bile duct passes posterior to the first part of the duodenum, 
with gastrojudinal artery on its left before opening into the second part of the duodenum in the ampulla of water when it joins the pancreatic duct. Take care. The left phrenic nerve both inferior down the neck to the lateral border of the scalens anterior. It passes medially across the border of the scalens anterior parallel to the internal jugular vein which lies inferior medially. At this point, it's deep to the prevertebral fascia, the transverse cervical artery and the subscapular artery as well. It descends between the left subclavian and the left common carotid artery and crosses the left surface of the arch of the aorta. It then crosses along the precardium, along the heart, superficial to the left auricle and the left ventricle, piercing the diaphragm just to the left of the precardium. It carries sensory fiber from the pleura, bricardium, and the small part of the peritoneum. At the origin of the right ureter, it is usually covered by the descending part of the duodenum, and in its course downward lies to the right of the inferior brachiva and crossed by the right colic and the idiocolic vessels. Remember, the urinary bladder is derived from two sources, the cloaca and mesonephric duct. The primitive cloaca is divided by the urocecal septum into urogenital sinus and the rectum. The bladder largely develops from the physical part of the urogenital sinus, while the mesonephric duct are drawn into the floor of the bladder as it expands to form the trigone. And the epithelium of the urinary bladder is derived from the endoderm of the urogenital sinus where the ureter and the pelvis epithelium derive from the mesoderm. So take care, the epithelium derive from the endoderm, while the ureter and pelvis epithelium derive from the mesoderm. Again, the urinary bladder epithelium derived from the endoderm. The ureter and pelvis epithelium derive from mesoderm. The femoral triangle is a very famous triangle which is anterior to the side and the anterior of the side and if you are looking from above the medial border of the sartorius will be the lateral border of this triangle and the inguinal ligament is the base of this triangle the medial border will be formed by the adductor longus so laterally sartorius medially adductor longus and above the base will be formed by the inguinal ligament the apex is uh, produced when the medial border of the sartorius uh, and the medial border of the abductor longus join together to form the apex of this triangle. The floor of the femoral triangle, abductor longus, part of abductor brevis, pectineus, and iliopsoas. Again, abductor longus, part of abductor brevis, pectineus, and iliopsoas. So take care. The abductor longus forms the medial part, and it's in the floor as well. The kidneys, urinary tract, and the majority of the reproductive organs arise from intermediate mesoderm between the somite and the lateral plate. Dear friends, when you have a mock day in the, in the schedule, this doesn't mean you have to finish only the mock. Try to uh, combine and revise all your screenshots you have taken and your points require improvement in those wide days. There are meant to be wide days in the schedule to make you able to revise. Because if I had added every day something to be done and uh, to be studied newly, you can't re have time to revise what you have studied before. Okay? God be with you. And by the way, if you have looked in the schedule for who started the schedule from the start, you will find you will be starting the records roughly about uh, one month and a half from the exam or more. The exam will be in 20 April and the uh, mocks uh, will be starting to be general and uh, starting the records from 10 of March. God be with you. Take care. The renal artery is posterior to the renal vein, and the kidney is retroperitoneal, and the peritoneal fat is enclosed within the renal fascia, the fascia of Zucker candle, or fascia of Girota. The pleura reaches to the line of the lateral uh, arcuate ligament, uh, from under which the subcostal nerve emerges posterior to the kidney. 
whatever approach you use, the renal vein will normally be anterior to the renal artery. Remember this, VAP, vein, artery, pelvis, vein, artery, pelvis. So, the renal vein will normally be anterior to the renal artery. Occasionally, the left renal vein is posterior to the aorta, which can make open aortic aneurysm surgical is hazardous. If you haven't looked carefully at the CT scan. And surprise, yes, the pleura will reach below the 12 rep. Remember that the prostate is supplied by the inferior vesicle vessel and it's an exocrine gland. The ejaculatory duct bursts through the prostate gland to empty into the urethra. The ureters rise superior posterior to the gland, draining into the trigone of the bladder. Again, the ureters are superior posterior to the gland and they are draining into the trigone of the bladder. And of course, the prostate is traversed by the ejaculatory duct. Remember that the external iliac artery passes obliquely in the retroperitoneal space and it passes downward and lateral along the media border of the psoas major. From the bifurcation of the common iliac to the point beneath the inguinal ligament. Remember that the deep external budinal artery usually arises from the femoral artery. Again, the deep external budinal artery arises from the femoral artery, but it may arise from the immediate circumflex femoral artery. Remember, at the origin of the external iliac artery, it's crossed by the ovarian vessel in female and occasionally by the ureter. At the upper part of its course, the external iliac vein lies partially behind it, but further down, the vein becomes entirely to the medial side. Of course, the inner canal is the terminal part of the alimentary canal, and the inner canal develops from the ectoderm over the cloacal membrane, which becomes the breast and form a pit in the proctoderm. The anal canal is a continuation of the rectum, which turns posteriorly through the pelvic floor and open externally at the anus. It measures approximately about 4 cm length. The anal canal posteriorly is related to the anocoxygeal body and laterally the elevator A9, which separates it from the anioscorectal uh, fossa. Anteriorly, the perineal body separates it from the vagina in the female and from the bulb of the penis in male and the prostate uh, gland. The canal is surrounded by internal and external anal sphincter. A very common question about the contents of the anal sphincters, which is responsible for the contents, the external anal sphincter or the internal. Of course, the external anal sphincter is responsible for the contents and take care during the lateral sphincterotomy you can cut the internal uh, sphincter, but you never touch the external. The liver has been classically divided into hexagonal lobules with a terminal tributary of hepatic vein at the center of each lobule. At each corner, uh, corner of the hexagonal lobule, you can identify a branch of the hepatic artery and portal vein and pillar tree known as the portal tract or the portal thread. The normal hepatic blood flow is 1.5 liter per minute, 1.5 liter per minute. It's about 30 to 40 from the hepatic artery and 60 to 70 from the portal vein. So the main blood supply of the liver is the portal vein. About two thirds of the liver mass are hepatocytes. The remaining of the mass is accounted for by the extracellular matters and the cell which line the sinusoids and bile duct and the blood vessels. There are usually three main hepatic veins, left, right, and middle, all of which drain directly into the inferior vena cava, the IVC. Several additional veins drain directly into the IVC, including what? The codate loop. Uh, the veins from the codate loop often remain patent in the butt carry syndrome allowing the codate loop to undergo compensatory hyperplasia. If we are talking about the liver, you have to know the Kupffer cells. 
the copper cells are the reticuloendothelial cells of the liver, which are major functional component of the reticuloendothelial system. Again, the copper cells have major functional component of the reticuloendothelial system in the liver. In the third nerve palsy, there is typically doses with dilated, unreactive pupil, and the eye pole is displaced downward and outward. Again, in third nerve palsy, there is ptosis with dilated unreactive pupil and the eyeball would be displaced downward and outward. There would be a dilatation, uh, not constriction of the pupil and diversion squint. The affected eye divided down and outward again. The increased lacrimation may be seen in uh, the seventh nerve palsy. In ophthalmos and meiosis are seen in Horner syndrome. The optic chiasm is situated at the junction of the floor of the anterior wall of the third ventricle. The fibers of the nasal half of the retina decussate in the chiasm and enter the optic tract before becoming the optic radiation. You have to know that the chiasm lies immediately superior to the pituitary fossa. An important fact to bear in mind when considering superior extension of the pituitary tumor, which will cause uh, sometimes uh, bilateral te by temporal hemianopia like in uh, gigantism or uh, acromegaly with a pituitary tumor. The commissure of garden, the commissure of garden is a connecting link between the medial genically body and is not deviated from the optic nerve. The muscle involved in the ankle reflex is the tibial nerve with root S1 and S2. Tibial nerve is the end of the sciatic nerve when the sciatic nerve bifurcate in the common peroneal and the tibial nerve in the popliteal fossa. When it leaves the popliteal fossa, the tibial nerve, when it leaves the popliteal fossa, it runs inferiorly and uh, on the tibialis posterior. It supplies the posterior muscle of the leg and the knee joint. It terminates by dividing into medial and lateral plantar nerve. Let's remember the reflex roots, the ankle jerk S1 and 2, knee 3 and 4, biceps 5 and 6, triceps 7 and 8. You will have fun if you have made it as a dance. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, yes? 1, 2, button my shoes, 3, 4, kick the door, 5, 6, pick the sticks, 7, 8, shut the gate. Let's move on singing and leave medicine. Remember, the radial nerve innervates the triceps muscle. It's a primarily divided from C7 root, and the radial nerve is the motor supply of the extensor compartment of the upper limb. It's very important. The tricep muscle is the chief extensor of the forearm. When you extend your muscle, it's by the triceps mainly. Its name derives from its three heads. It's attached to the olecranion of the ulna as well. Take care. The spinal roots passing through the foramen magnum join the cranial root to form the accessory nerve. The jugular foramen, which contains the inferior betrothal sinus anterior compartment and the termination of the sigmoid sinus posterior compartment, uh, also contain the vagus nerve, the accessory nerve, and the lusopharyngeal nerve. The vertebral vein doesn't pass into the skull. The vertebral vein doesn't pass into the skull. Let's remember some important foramen structure. Foramen spinosum, very famous for the middle meningeal artery and vein. Again, foramen spinosum, very famous for the middle meningeal artery and vein and the meningeal branch of the mandibular nerve. Never forget that the optic canal through which the optic nerve of the ophthalmic artery pass. The jugular foramen, the very famous foramen and important foramen in the skull through which the inferior petrosian sinus, glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, accessory spinal nerve, sigmoid sinus and the posterior meningeal artery pass through. All of this from the jugular foramen. Here, the superior orbital fissure is not the optic canal, the optic canal, optic nerve, while 
the superior orbital fissure, the oculomotor nerve and the ophthalmic nerve and tracheal nerve and abducens and superior ophthalmic. But the optic nerve from the optic canal. While the oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic, abducens and superior ophthalmic vein, all from the fissure, not the canal. All those from now. But from where does the facial nerve get out? From the internal aquatic meses, the facial nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve, and labyrinthine artery. The deltoid muscle is supplied by the axillary nerve, which has nerve root 5 and 6. The gastrocnemius is supplied by the tibial nerve, which has nerve root S1, S2. The rectus femoris and the three vastaric muscle, the intermediate, medialis, and lateralis, are supplied by the femoral nerve, which has nerve root. L2, L3, L4, L2, L3, L4, femoral nerve for the anterior compartment of the thigh. The tricep brachii is supplied by the radial nerve C5, C8, and T1. Again, tricep brachii is supplied by the radial nerve C5, A, T1, which has a nerve root of C6, lateral head, and C7 for the long head and C8 for the medial head. Remember that the musculocutaneous nerve is a branch of the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. Remember, the lateral spinocalamic tract contains fibers that project non-specific ceramic nuclei. The axon carrying sensory information synapse in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They decussate at the end pass of the second order neuron to the thalamus and reticular formation. The posterior column decussate at the brain stem. Pain temperature are associated with the lateral spinothalamic tract. The anterior spinothalamic tract is associated with touch fiber. Remember that the fibers of the lateral spinothalamic tract pass to the thalamus and the reticular formation and they have no direct pass in the cerebellum. So, anterior spinothalamic tract, crude touch and the pressure, and the lateral spinothalamic tract for temperature and pain. Remember some facts about the dermatomes. C1 gives no supply to the skin. And the occiput is supplied by C2. C5 supplies the outer aspect of the shoulder. Shoulder 5. Shoulder 5. C7 is the longest cervical spinous process and supplies the middle finger, the longest finger. So the longest cervical spinous process supplies the middle finger, which is the longest finger. C8, the little finger. So, the sum C6, the middle, C7, the little, C8. Very common in the exam. T3 lies in the axilla. T8, T10, T12 supplies a red margin and the umbilicus and the pubis. Uh, very important to know that the umbilicus T10 is a landmark wherever you are examined. Any exam in the world ask you about the umbilicus T10, the rib margin T8, and the pubis T12, the groin L1, L3 supplies the knee, L5 runs diagonally and forms the outer aspect of the tibia and the inner aspect of the foot. You stand on S1, the ankle. L5 supplies the very toe. S1 supplies the little toe. S3, 4, and 5 are concentric ring around the anus. By the way, the dermatome have a dance. Try it. Okay, we have two abductor pollicis. The abductor pollicis longus and the abductor pollicis brevis. The abductor pollicis brevis is intrinsic muscle of the hand supplied by uh, the medial nerve uh, and the opponent's pollicis. While the abductor pollicis longus 
is supplied by the radial nerve. Take care, the median nerve is composed of fibers from C5 to T1, and in hand it supplies the abductor pollicis brevis, the opponent's pollicis, the flexor pollicis brevis, the first and second lateral lumbricals. And in the forearm, it supplies most of the flexors except for the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial half of the flexor digitorum profunda. The flexor digitorum profunda is double innervated by the medial and the later uh, the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve supplies the medial half of the flexor digitorum profunda and the flexor carpi ulnaris. In the hand, mostly inflated by the ulnar nerve except for the opponents and the opponents muscle and the thinner muscles are, are all supplied by the median nerve except for the, ab, the abductor uh, pollicis. Take care. The cavernous sinus is a very important dangerous area in the face and um, the nerves passes through this cavernous sinus are the oculomotor nerve, trochal nerve, and ophthalmic and maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, as well as the abducens nerve. It's very important to know that C7 vertebrae is known as vertebrae prominence because it can be palpated first uh, after road traffic accident for examination. You will examine the first valvular cervical spinous uh, process of the C7. Remember that the C7, uh, which is a vertebral prominence, as we said, is the first palpable spinous process because C1 to C6 uh, cervical vertebrae are covered by the ligamentum nuchae. Remember, the subclavian vein is continuation of the axillary vein, beginning at the lateral border of the first rib. It passes anterior to the scanus anterior, and the subclavian and the internal jugular vein unite to form brachiocephalic vein and eventually the left and right brachiocephalic vein unite to form superior vena cava. The thoracic duct enters the left subclavian. The brachiocephalic trunk is a branch of the aortic uh, arch and um, it divides to form the right subclavian and right common carotid arteries. Again, the brachiocephalic trunk is a branch of the aortic arch, which is divided to form right subclavian and right common carotid arteries. Try to imagine the artery and the venous tree, and take care from the question is asking about artery or a vein, and don't confuse them ever. When we are talking about the vein, think from the distal to proximal. When we are talking about the artery, think about it from proximal to distal. So happy you have been working on the point required improvement. Never say a defect. It's a point required improvement. And we all have it. Just with practice and revision and re-revision, we will be masters of any surgery, masters of any study. You are a surgeon and never forget it. God be with you, so happy to have been with you today.